for more uh, on the anniversary uh, of the start of the war in Syria. We can talk to our international affairs commentator, Doug Herbert. Doug, hello. Know, yeah. um, you know, the war in Syria has been truly devastating. Hundreds of thousands of people yeah. killed, half the population of Syria displaced. Assad, though, the Syrian president, he remains in power. What are your thoughts on how it is that he's been able to survive all this time? First of all, you're, you're absolutely right. There's something almost surrealistic about the fact that this is a man who is still standing. And it's very easy to forget. I mean, 10 years is a long time, but it's a short time at the same time. Not too long ago, 2013, 2014, uh, basically his days were numbered. Everyone thought that his fall was imminent. In fact, people thought his fall was imminent at the very beginning of the uprising. Back in 2011, uh, they thought that you know this was going to be the latest domino to fall in the in the string of so-called Arab Spring uprisings that he was a very fragile almost teetering figure. Well, we obviously know that the next decade has proven very, very tragically uh, uh, and bloodily otherwise. Uh, look, what are some of the reasons that he is still standing and that he hasn't faced any accountability? It does. Part of the blame begins with the West. Western powers, especially the U.S., Europe, why? They signally failed to recognize uh, what had been a body which was really opposed, uh, a potentially strong body, political body, opposed to Assad back in 2011, within months after the uh, the uprising started, the Syrian National Council pleaded, begged for support. The West never fully diplomatically uh, recognized it, never really gave it the support. That left Assad basically as the only man without any real credible opposition that had the support that it needed, which obviously created the perfect vacuum for Russia to come in in 2015, as you'll remember, as I remember, uh, coming in along with Iran and basically from that point on having Assad's back and giving him that, cre that, that, that sort of semblance of not just legitimacy but the fact if he falls, there's no one else to step in and take his place. And unfortunately, there's a part of that argument you can almost say, well, they were right. Well, you know, Assad remains, as you say, but in recent months there has been sort of internationally this increasing focus on trying to hold his government, the people around him, to account for crimes committed during the war. Tell us a bit about what those moves are. Well, first of all, let's let's be more emphatic about it. Not just crimes committed during the war, Nadia, as we know, chemical weapons, some of the worst usage of chemical arms in this century. Uh, we are talking, obviously, about the notorious uh, incidents in August 2013 around uh, Duma and also around uh, uh, eastern uh, Damascus, a suburb of Damascus in Ghouta, uh, in that area. How many people died in that incident? 1,400. I mean, it's unbelievable when you think back today. And, and you stand there and you say, well, wait, what happened? What do you mean? There was no accountability for that? He has gone unpunished. No one has been held to account. There have been some trials of low-level Syrian operatives who fled abroad, who were tried in courts on, on, on sort of various related offenses. What we're seeing now, though, finally, is the possibility, and I have to say only a possibility and the rumblings of it, France and Germany, international uh, human rights groups, are filing lawsuits, have filed lawsuits, in which they hope to... Uh, hold basically Assad, go right to the top, not the underlings anymore, Assad, his brother Maher, and a litany of senior military officials uh, and other officials around him in his security apparatus to account for these chemical attacks, which, like I said, killed 1,400 people and not just killed them uh, in with conventional bombs killed them with sarin nerve agent from the breathing of chlorine fumes from bombs. Uh, and there's a lot of video support right now. So watch that space. This was a lawsuit filed in the past month uh, in the war crimes unit of France's sort of court, the Palace of Justice here. And it's also doubled, uh, you know, supported by a German uh, lawsuit as well. So his day of reckoning hasn't come. But these lawsuits at least perhaps mean that all of this will be outed in an international court. And France does believe it has universal jurisdiction. It's not limited to just trying people when it's about war crimes here in France. It can apply beyond France's borders. All right. Douglas Herbert, thank you very much indeed.